So our last speaker is Denise Duffield. She is the Associate Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility in Los Angeles, and she directs its Nuclear Threats Program. That program advocates for health protective policies related to nuclear weapons and nuclear energy. She leads the PSR Los Angeles efforts to ensure a full cleanup of the Santa Susana Field Laboratory, a former nuclear facility near Los Angeles. She also serves on the board of the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability, which is a national network of organizations that works to address issues of nuclear weapons production and waste cleanup. I'm going to give you her title. The Santa Susana Field Laboratory, the impact of broken cleanup promises on community health. Thank you, Denise, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Cheryl. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Can yes. you hear me okay? All right, very good. And thank you so much uh, for, for inviting me to speak at this um, conference today. Um, yes, my, my um, presentation is on the Santa Susana Field Laboratory and the impact of broken cleanup promises on community health. So I will be talking about all those things interwoven throughout the presentation. The site itself, its history, how it got contaminated, uh, the cleanup promises we had, how they got broken, and the impact that has had on community health over the years. And let me start my time here. Here we go. Um, first, a little bit about my organization. I'm with Physicians for Social Responsibility in Los Angeles. We are the largest chapter of the national organization, Physicians for Social Responsibility. We bring together the credible voices of health professionals with the lived experiences of impacted communities to advocate for policies and practices that improve public health, eliminate nuclear and environmental threats, and address health disparities. And that is a picture there of our founder on the far right, Dr. Richard Saxon, who uh, lived in the San Fernando Valley, also near the site. And this is sort of one of our first efforts in, in the 80s to um, actually having pairing physicians with impacted communities. Santa Susana Field Laboratory location. You can see here, it's about uh, 30 some miles um, from downtown Los Angeles. This is another view that sort of shows the elevation and the valleys nearby. And you can imagine with contamination, which is what we're talking about more here at the, at the field lab, um, that uh, gravity wants to pull things down. And you can see there uh, the, the San Fernando Valleys and the Simi Valleys um, surrounding the site. Um, this particular map um, shows, again, some of the neighboring um, communities that are around the site. And this uh, also gives you a, a, an idea of the proximity to populated areas. Uh, the site was established in the late 40s for rocket testing. In 1949, the Atomic Energy Commission was looking for a remote nuclear testing lab for work that was too dangerous to do in populated areas. Santa Susana ranked, ranked fifth out of six for meteorological safety criteria, but it was chosen anyway because of the driving time to UCLA. The power of the reactors was supposed to be limited to reduce the dose to the nearby population, but that limit was set aside and a large test re reactor was uh, soon constructed, and that is the sodium reactor exper experiment, which did have a partial meltdown in 1959. Uh, population has continued to encroach over the years, and we now have 700,000 people residing within 10 miles of the site. The the sodium reactor experiment was the first reactor to provide commercial nuclear power to any U.S. city. So the city of Moore Park, California, uh, was the very first city to have uh, electricity that was generated by nuclear power. And the reactor um, that did that melted, <laughs> meltdown, and the contamination remains, uh, is still there today. Um, during that meltdown, um, the um, the doors were, there was no containment dome on the reactor for the sodium reactor experiment like you see in, in tradition in other um, cooling towers. Uh, um, and so when the um, radiation level started to rise, they just opened the doors and, and vented the gases out into the environment. Um, and there's a, a wind data that shows that it went over um, as the day, as the, the wind direction changes course in this area. So both valleys were exposed. 
we still have people who try to deny that it was in fact a meltdown. So we always include this picture there where it says melted blob, very technical term. The um, sodium reactor experiment was one of 10 reactors that were at the site, others of which had um, accidents as well. Uh, there was um, a hot lab where they would reprocess that nuclear fuel that was brought in from around the country. Um, there were other reactors that had accidents. The radioactive materials handling facility had leaks. There was a sodium burn pit where there was open air burning of radioactive waste, which we've heard about. Um, and uh, the hot lab, which had radioactive fires. So these activities, the nuclear activities went on for over four decades. So when people will sometimes say, oh, that meltdown happened a long time ago, you know, um, in, in how, much how much contamination could, it, could still be there? And we always have to explain there were many, many, many other kinds of nuclear activities that happened at the site and they happened over a course of decades and a lot of um, recklessness and, and sloppy environmental practices which resulted in such widespread contamination. At least three other reactors suffered accidents. Uh, radioactive fires at the hot lab, and then um, also releases from the plutonium fuel fabrication facility and other spills and releases. In addition, there were over 30,000 rocket engine tests uh, that took place at Santa Susana over the course of five decades, which also resulted in very heavy chemical contamination. Uh, the history of improper disposal of, of hazardous materials. Again, um, burned for decades. Uh, Rocket Dime, which was the former uh, owner of the site before um, Boeing acquired the property, um, which I'll talk about in a bit, had been, was cited for unpermitted hazardous uh, burning of hazardous materials. In the 90s, two workers were killed by an explosion caused by illegal disposal of materials. And at that time, uh, the SSFL got one of the largest um, environmental fines at the time. And again, this really ties into to Joni's presentation too about why the burning, why, why this sort of sloppy procedures. And this is um, from a document that was um, after the meltdown actually. And they talked about um, the creating the burn pits and um, that this procedure eliminated the costly method that was in use at that time of trucking them from the facility and dumping them in the ocean or, and I think this is where we are at a lot today, complicated ways of disposal, but required permits from various official agencies. They also would, uh, workers would uh, shoot at barrels of, of toxic waste, which caused them to explode. Um, and the contamination um, has gotten offsite and has uh, resulted in health impacts for the offsite community and the workers. Some of the contaminants of concern, uh, the radionuclides, we're talking about cesium-137, strontium-90, plutonium-239, tritium. In 2012, the EPA uh, did a survey in just the nuclear area of this site and uh, found hundreds of samples over background, including some over a thousand times background. And we know that the National Academy of Scientists has concluded there's no safe level of exposure to radiation. And some of the chemicals at the site are TCE, perchlorate, dioxins, heavy metals. Uh, many are regulated at, at a few parts per billion, but are very large uh, quantities present at the site. Um, and uh, for example, uh, TCE, we're talking about uh, 500,000 gallons that are estimated to be in the soil in the aquifer. Exposure pathways to the public, airborne dust, particularly on windy days. And we do have a lot of wind in the area, Santa Ana conditions that are quite frequent. Um, we worry about this um, from a health perspective. Uh, if you are, uh, walking by a piece of uh, some, something that's contaminated, if you walk by a pile of, let's say, radioactively contaminated dirt, your exposure is going to end the time that you, you walk by it. But if you ingest or you inhale of those particles, even a micro particle, your dose is going to be much higher. It will stay in the body until it is excreted and um, can result in, in greater health, harm to health. We also have surface water runoff from the site, and um, Boeing has been had numerous violations over the years. There's groundwater contamination. Residential development near the site has also made contaminated dust a lot. And of course, now we have this awful combination of climate change um, with nuclear facilities, nuclear power, nuclear weapons. All of these uh, are bad um, combinations taking into account the climate crisis. And in our case, we've had um, several times, including very recently, wildfires that have also heightened public exposure to Santa Susana's contaminants. This is a, a photo that also show, that showed you some of the grading that happened um, for the Runkle Canyon development um, and how it's just, um, just downslope from the field lab. 
This uh, shows some of the other areas highlighted in yellow are areas where Santa Susana contamination has been found, not in the whole areas. Um, and some of this uh, was found by would-be developers and some of it was just um, offsite uh, surveys that happened that, that the um, responsible parties had done. Um, and we found in 19, 1993 to 95, um, Brandeis Bardeen Institute, which is a children's camp below the site, found plutonium 239, strontium 90, cesium 137, and others, perchlorate in Amundsen Ranch, strontium 90, cesium 137, and perchlorate in Dayton Canyon, and then also strontium 90 and perchlorate in Runkle Canyon. And uh, the community fought very hard to not to prevent development in the area. And uh, out of these, <clears throat> we lost two out of three. Amundsen Ranch uh, was spared, but Dayton Canyon and Runkle Canyon now have very um, uh, uh, significant developments, residential develops, developments. This map shows a TCE plume that goes off site. Here's some maps from a uh, UCLA study that was conducted in 2007 about the potential for offsite migration that shows some of the contaminants that were found in the soil just, out, uh, just outside of the site. Um, this one uh, shows some of the offsite wells or spring contamination just outside of the site. And you can see it's, it's uh, all the way around. Um, it's again, the surface water runoff is a concern. Um, and the um, Boeing from 2002 to 2014 was fined over a million dollars by the LA Regional Water Quality Board. But one thing we try to talk about why these fines don't stop the exceedances and don't stop public exposures is it's just for many times it's the cost of doing business for these companies. In this case, it was less than a millionth of Boeing's annual income by the end of that year, which would be the equivalent of a six cent fine for an average family um, at that time. So the fines don't stop the violations. After the 2018 Woolsey fire, which I hope to be able to talk about um, depending on my time here, 57 exceedances were found, um, but the water board waived the fine saying that it was an act of God and we were, of course, saying, well, you know, if they had cleaned up the site, then there wouldn't have been the exceedances. So we disagreed with that decision. Health impacts of the radionuclides on the site. Um, again, the, the, the ones that we are primarily concerned about at Santa Susana um, would be was a cesium-137, strontium-90, and plutonium, along with the tritium. And these all um, can cause cancer. Many times there's a long latency period um, after exposure. They are difficult um, to clean up. And the same thing with chemicals. Um, all of these also have um, very significant um, health impacts if people are exposed to them. Um, and uh, there was a multi-year epidemiological study by the UCLA School of Public Health, which found increases in death rates among the most exposed workers from cancers of the lung, lymph, and blood. Another independently federally funded study found that key cancers increased the closer one lived to Santa Susana. And then another one, which I showed you some of the um, graphics from before, um, found that, that Santa, Susan, Santa Susana contamination does migrate over EPA levels of concern. Um, for the workers, uh, many of them are available or are eligible for compensation. And some of the, um, you know, the, the problems that we're finding now is oftentimes workers trying to get compensation uh, will find that their records have been falsified or destroyed. Um, many of the claimants need assistance to be able to even prove they worked at the site. And so um, while uh, I think a good 3,000 have applied, I think maybe a third of those have actually gotten any kind of compensation. More recently, we've been concerned about pediatric cancers near the site. Um, in 2015, a uh, young mother to the right, uh, bottom right there, Melissa Bumstead, um, began meeting other parents in Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and um, was surprised to find out that they, uh, their children also had rare cancers and then that they lived there. And she started um, doing some research, talking to statisticians and um, began to map those out and became very alarmed at the, the number of, of pediatric cancers near the site. This is our, one of our doctors, Dr. Jimmy Hara, uh, who's talking at an event about those. And then um, on the left there is another little girl, uh, Hazel Hammersley, who's, um, um, who did not survive for cancer, who passed away in 2019. Cleanup agreements. The site, the responsible parties are the Department of Energy, which is responsible for cleaning up the Area 4, which is where most of the nuclear area contamination occurred. The um, NASA, which owns uh, uh, Area 2 and part of Area 1, 
and then Boeing, which owns uh, the vast majority of the area. DOA actually leases its property from Boeing. I should be clear about that. Uh, in 2010, after many years of fighting, um, we had a, a wonderful cleanup agreement, um, which so we thought, which was instead of fighting about risk levels um, and all these things, that, that we would clean up the site to background. Over $40 million of uh, stimulus money was spent to do a background survey of the uh, areas near Santa Susana to establish the background values to make sure that the responsible parties wouldn't have to clean up anything they weren't responsible for. The idea was to restore the site to its natural state before it had been contaminated. So if this is the average background level for any contaminant, and this is what we found at Santa Susana, that's how much gets cleaned up. Um, this DOE and NASA signed orders with the state uh, Department of Toxic Substances Control agreeing to this cleanup to background. The state in this case has a th regulatory authority over even the federal agencies. And they have authority, of course, over a Boeing to, um, do, to RICRA. So uh, DTSC said at that time that it would require Boeing to clean up to comparable standards. Looking at the land use, saying in their, their normal policy, absent of any um, laws, or, or, or uh, we had another law, SB 990, which would have required a strict cleanup. But their normal policy is to look at, at the allowable uses in land zoning. And Santa Susana's area is zoned open space with allowable uses of uh, residential and agricultural. And those land uses provide a stricter cleanup standard because they're assuming that somebody is going to be on the site, maybe growing things on the site, have, um, and so it would require a, a, a stricter level of cleanup. And um, that's just a line. And this is important because you can see that the area is, there are cows um, in, the, in the ranches nearby, um, another pathway of exposure actually. Um, here's a cow that uh, wandered down into the nuclear area, of uh, area four. Um, but we, we, it was not really, the ink wasn't dry on those cleanup agreements before we started to see some real intervention by Boeing and the cleanup promises being broken. Um, and I'm gonna go into a little bit about how that happened now. Um, under the Brown administration, a, a Boeing and lobbyist activated a campaign to replace the DTSC staff that had been the manager and working on these agreements and to undermine the agreements. This is a, a phenomenon sometimes called as a revolving door, where you have people who work at an agency um, and, and then go and uh, leave the agency, become lobbyists for, in this case, Boeing, and then come back and lobby their, their former colleagues. And this is sort of a graphic that shows some, some of the folks um, that followed that path that, that um, we believe are instrumental in the undoing of the cleanup agreements. Um, we also found that state law that I mentioned that would have required a, a cleanup. Um, also at that same time, um, we found that DTSC had agreed to not contest any of Boeing's statements of material fact before having even seen them. So when um, the matter was decided, the judge in the, in the appeal actually said, well, you know, DTSC didn't contest any of Boeing's statements. In fact, most of what, many of which were, were just, were false. Then um, we found out from an insider at DTSC that um, Boeing had launched a, a greenwashing campaign. And we started looking online for the company that they were working with to find out what was in it. And it turned out that they um, hired a graphic designer who liked the design of, of the plan so much that he put it online. So through the graphic designer's website, we were able to find exactly what was being planned. And they said quite, quite plainly that they were going to identify and build the stature of third parties who could help alle uh, blunt allegations of greenwashing and turn the Santa Susana story from one with a sordid past to one with potential. They hired a firm um, that created a, a community advisory group or an astroturf group is what we call, which is essentially a, a fake community group. Many of the people that are on that group uh, fighting the cleanup, um, have ties to the responsible parties, used to work for DOE. Uh, Boeing's former project manager repurposed himself for a community member to serve on that committee and uh, began then to, to fight the cleanup. Um, and um, DTSC went ahead and sanctioned it. And the, uh, this AstroTurf group has, in fact, received $34,000 from DOE to fight the very cleanup agreement that DOE signed. Uh, a lot of misinformation has been put out um, trying to convince the public that the cleanup is somehow worse than the contamination, um, trying to say there's going to be a truck going by your house every second of every day and you're going to be exposed at the same time saying that, that there's, the contamination is not that bad, never caused any health effects. Um, you can see this ridiculous picture of a dust cloud like that. Um, some of the um, 
misinformation going around trying to inquire, um, inspire opposition to the cleanup. Boeing went so far as to create a website called Protect Santa Susana, Protect Santa Susana from the cleanup. And this website had a take action button and it had people sending in comments to the DTSC recommending the weakest, weakest cleanup, a recreational level cleanup. Um, we've never seen this. You see nonprofits all the time, hey, take action. Here's their action letter, send your comment in. We've never seen one before by a responsible party um, to actually um, get people to comment in against the cleanup of these incredibly toxic materials. We did not like that. So we created our own website, Protect Santa Susana from Boeing, where we tried to sort of point by point counter um, the misinformation that was on the website. Um, we this, also in 2015, um, we got more information on the risk levels associated with the contaminants at Santa Susana. And some of it came directly from Boeing's risk assessment reports, finding that in some areas of the site, if somebody lived on the site, 96 out of 100 people would get cancer. And after Boeing's proposed cleanup, that number would fall to five and 10. The EPS, US EPA uh, goes for one in a million. So we're talking about an incredible amount of contamination that would remain on that site with a weak um, cleanup. Um, and so this, this is uh, other areas um, of the site that was for um, the systems test lab area. Uh, other areas would be every third person, another area would be every fifth person, another area every 10th person. Um, this, uh, when this came out, there was um, media about it, and this is a, a cartoon that, that we liked a lot because um, at the same time, basically two years later, Boeing applied for an open space easement and to try to say this land is going to be uh, open space, a park forever, therefore we should have the very weakest cleanup level. Open space cleanups are based off of people being on the site infrequently, so they would be weak. And, we, and this is, by the way, uh, making contaminated sites into parks or, or wildlife refuge is something we've seen before. You can see that the, the Rocky Flat site, for example. Um, and the problem is that people who live near the site, they don't live in open space. They live in residential and they live right next to the site or they live downhill from it. And so you just can't leave that amount of contamination on the site, regardless of the land use without having additional exposures. Then in 2018, I turned on my TV and saw uh, the rocket test stands up in flames and um, became very concerned because I recognized them immediately as being the Santa Susana Field Laboratory. That fire did in fact start on the site. For a long time, they would say it was near Rocketdyne or near Santa Susana, but a helicopter pilot who was flying over the site at the time uh, took a, a, to another fire that day took this photograph and we instantly recognized it as the field lab as actually starting on the, on the side of the field lab. Um, we also had heard that there was a, an, uh, an incident at the Chatsworth substation just prior to, this, to the fire and the Chatsworth substation is located on the Santa Susana site. It was actually built to, to relay the power from that, that meltdown, the SRE that melted down. So here you can see where the apparent start is, where the substation is and where, how close it was to the site of the meltdown. That fire eventually burned all the way to the coast and had 70 mile an hour winds. Um, our state agency, uh, even before, even the very night of the fire was telling people there was nothing to worry about, did not even ask people to put on masks, which would be advisable in any wildfire because it's all kinds of nasty chemicals and wildfires. They took very few measurements um, after the fire. Um, they compared them to the wrong screening levels. But even so, they did find elevated radiation. They just uh, dismissed it. And our state senator um, had some questions about that during the time. Um, they also, uh, Boeing also had best management practices to try to limit um, the offsite contamination uh, in the surface water, but they were made out of flammable materials. They're made out of stale straw bales and plastic piping and they burnt up during the fire. Therefore, after the fire, there were 57 exceedances of pollution leaving the site. Um, and they did in fact admit that the exceedances were because of the fire, because the fire burned the vegetation, made the contaminants in the soil more mobile. So when the rain came, more of it came off the site. And you, this is a problem because <laughs> the field lab is also the headwaters of the LA River. And the LA River of course goes straight to the Pacific Ocean. Um, we found out recently, um, we got some um, encrypted emails um, from someone uh, at the water board who wanted us to make sure that we knew that the chair of the water board had received some very sizable contributions from Boeing 
prior um, to her having dismissed all of those, um, the, 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 the fines. And uh, the Public em Employees for Environmental Responsibility has filed a, uh, a, a with the Attorney General asking for a criminal investigation. Uh, we did also have our own um, sampling done after the fire. We had um, volunteers offer to sample soils, uh, ash that was collected. And um, Marco Kaltofen uh, was a researcher with Maggie and Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education. Um, we were able to um, analyze those samples and have a, a finding in the Journal of Environmental Radioactivity um, that there were uh, there was um, elevated radiation in about three percent of the sample. Um, some of them were quite high, and some of them uh, one of the particles that they found quite a bit was thorium. Um, and then um, Melissa, who I told you about, the community member, um, has since been receiving um, many many emails from people talking about um, increases in uh, glioblastoma since the fire. And when we told this to Marco Kaltofen, and he, he, he made a stop. He said, wait, say that again. Um, apparently, um, I did not know this, but thorium is highly associated with glioblastoma. So this is a photo of one of our researchers in some of the areas where the um, contamination was found. Current status of cleanup efforts, uh, not good. Um, NASA released a supplemental EIS that proposes leaving 80% of the contamination not cleaned up and is trying to make the site into a cultural heritage district. Um, one of the, when we made the cleanup agreements, we put in certain exemptions because we know that there, there are Native American artifacts on the site, some, some. There are some endangered plants and species. And so we had written into the agreements that if there was officially recognized cultural artifacts or officially recognized endangered plants or species, you wouldn't have to clean up the background in those areas. So what NASA is basically saying is, hey, the whole site's a cultural artifact, so it shouldn't have to be cleaned up. Um, Department of Energy is proposing uh, leaving 98% of the contamination on site, and Boeing is currently in secret negotiations with DTSC pushing for this week recreational cleanup. This is a, just a visual of what um, NASA would be required to clean up if it actually complied with the cleanup agreement on the left versus what it wants to clean up on the right. Um, this is an article about making the, the site a, a historic landmark. I need to say also that there, there are these paintings in an area called Burrow Flats. It's about, and it's already been in the National Register of Historic Places. So NASA's application went to expose the boundaries, uh, expand the boundaries from 11 acres here to 2,850 to encompass the entire site. They did not in their application mention one word about the contamination, one word about the way that the land had been disturbed just from, from the activities of building roads and, and um, buildings and all of that. And in fact, um, they got their application sent back to them and are uh, believed trying to, to resubmit it. Um, another LA Times article uh, pushing back against the idea that it should be a historic landmark. These are some of the, um, this is the Department of Energy's proposed cleanup, what it would look like if they actually followed the AOC versus what they um, are looking to do. Um, and also <laughs> talking about demolitions, um, DOE this summer um, demolished the building, or last summer, some buildings and um, the fall, it was the fall. And uh, somebody posted video of it online and you can see there from the right, um, there's not a lot of dust mitigation going on there. They said they were gonna use water canyons, make a wall of water to try to mitigate the dust. They say they did that. Um, I don't see it. And so this is another cause for concern. Whoops, um, I mentioned um, that the DTSC and our um, state agency are having some secret um, negotiations right now that the public is not enabled to, to, be a, to, to weigh in on. We've had some conversations with um, DTSC and our Cal EPA. Um, a lot of what, where these, um, the, the devil's in the details. Um, there's, there's talk about changing some of the inputs and the standardized risk SRAM, standardized risk assessment methodology. Um, small little things to be able to say it's a cleanup or it's a comprehensive cleanup, but when we go and we look and we have, we're, we're blessed to work with Dan Hirsch of uh, the Community Bridge of the Gap, whose students found the meltdown and is just an expert and can bring teams of students to read volumes of documents, volumes of reports and, and go and check um, the footnotes and where we find some of these devils in the details. So we believe that, that um, they'll be coming out soon and making an announcement about the results of that mediation. Um, Boeing's continue 
continuing its greenwashing. It recently donated a million dollars um, for an overpass for the mountain lines. We're all for that, um, but we think it's a little disingenuous for um, Boeing to be doing that now and yet fighting the cleanup tooth and nail. Also, I should add, the contaminants at Santa Susana are not good for wildlife either. And we've had pushback on, it, on trying to get even compliance with an ecological risk standard. We have the support of our local elected officials. Normally in any situation, you wanna to, to go to your representative. I always tell people they're called your representative because they represent you, talk to them. Well, we have strong champions in Congress. Uh, recently had a letter signed by our, our Senator and uh, several of our Congress members, mayors of numerous cities nearby. Um, and, um, but so far we are still looking at a pretty dismal situation. So we're expecting next month the results of the Boeing and DTSC on negotiations to be released. DTSC says its, its new programmatic EIR will be released this summer. We expect that it will weaken the cleanup agreement. Um, if the site is not fully cleaned up, current and future generations will continue to be at risk of exposure. And I think this is a really important point and it ties on, on what Joni said as well. This is a public health issue, but it's also a moral issue. Given the length of time that these contaminants are dangerous, which in some cases due to the half-life are you know, hundreds of years, or in the case of plutonium-90, centuries, um, more than centuries, uh, a millennia. And the people that will be impacted to them, maybe not, they're not even born right now. They can't weigh in on an EIR. They, they are entirely dependent on us to care about future generations and to make decisions with those generations in mind, because the people that will be impacted by them right now, many of them don't even, they're, they're not even born to be able to weigh in. So this is a public health issue, um, but more than anything else, it, it is a moral issue. And um, I think we, we see this happening in all kinds of environmental fights. Um, there's just a willingness to, to um, trade off our children's health and environment for short-term gains um, to save money. Oh, look, there goes my thing. I'm, and that's 30 minutes. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, so that was a, a great deal of information about one uh, field laboratory that I must say I didn't even know existed, uh, just a few miles from downtown Los Angeles. Uh, a lot of these places were chosen in the 1940s and 1950s to be uh, nuclear weapons sites and, and rocket engine testing uh, that would be NASA, I suppose, needed to test its uh, engines that eventually took us to the moon and stuff. Um, but with the increasing population, uh, people's houses are now being built near these sites. And uh, the wind blows things over into their areas. So do we, we have four minutes for questions. I would like to encourage you uh, you will be able to watch a recording of this um, whole session. The, in, and there's one thing I forgot to say, if I can just yes, jump yes, in Denise, really quick. Um, I, I really do want to, um, whoops, to just share my screen for one second, if I may, um, because um, I want to, um, if you're thinking that this sounds like a movie, um, in fact, it, uh, it has been, there is a documentary called In the Dark of the Valley that is extraordinarily powerful in showing the human side. It was uh, aired by MSNBC this fall, but it's available still for streaming on MSNBC and NBC apps, as well as YouTube TV, Fubo, and Hulu Plus. So in the dark of the valley, um, if you want more information on this story, please um, look it up and, and take a look at that. Um, take a look at that documentary, it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, questions from the room here or online? Yes, sir? increasing level of radioactivity of the surface of the earth is not only a set of local problems here and there, it is a global problem. Entropy with time, global entropy, increases with time. This is one of the fundamental laws of thermodynamics. Radioactive materials, uh, well, of course they decay with time, but they decay with time not as fast as, as we wish. And the amount of radioactive materials on the surface of the Earth with time is increasing. Uh, radioactive uh, nuclei are not modified by chemical react reactions. 
So when we talk about cleanup, well, cleanup of radioactive materials is very different from, what you, from how you clean your house. Radioactive materials cannot be destroyed. They can only be moved from one place to another. So locally, you can de decrease entropy, but globally, the entropy is increased. So here is a global problem, in increasing radioactivity of the surface of the Earth on which we live, increasing radioactivity of biosphere. Uh, when you ask some uh, governmental agencies for cleanup, what do you expect as a result of that cleanup? They will move radi uh, radioactive waste from one place to another. Will it be safer to have it in another place? Maybe, but it is still in biosphere. So what is your expectation from cleanup? Well, you're absolutely right in terms of when we say cleanup, that it's not cleanup in the sense of you know washing, uh, washing a piece of clothing and now it's clean. It's moving on contaminated soil, in this case, contaminated soil. But it is really important where it gets moved to. Um, we have, my organization is still in a lawsuit right now because part of the agreements are that any uh, radioactive debris or soil that is radioactively contaminated above background must go to a properly licensed site. Properly licensed sites for low level radioactive waste are handled differently than other kind of municipal sites. There's multiple barriers between the environment. There's a health physicist on site. They are handled differently. Um, what was happening at Santa Susana is the contaminated soil and building debris was going to uh, municipal facilities, going to recyclers, going to uh, hazardous waste sites that are not licensed to, to accept low-level radioactive waste. So yes, you're, you're in the big picture, you are correct. However, we can isolate these materials better from the environment, from populated areas. And um, you know, going back to Don's presentation, we've got we've got we've got to get moving on that. There is a lot of it, and um, there has to be a safe, permanent. Um, geological repository for high-level waste and safe repositories that have all of those additional protections for low-level radioactive waste um, because we have to do the best that we can to prevent public exposures, um, given the fact that, yes, it's increasing. And of course, the other thing we might consider doing is moving towards truly clean and renewable energy and eliminating all of our nuclear weapons so that we don't continue to add even more to what we have now. Thank you, Denise. We have one question, which will be the last one from Anonymous online. Thank you for the informative talk. As a California resident, what can I do to help? Also, how much money do you estimate Boeing and NASA would spend if it did the cleanup properly? I don't know about the Boeing part. Um, I know that um, NASA has offered some really hefty um, figures. Part of this um, is, is another um, problem we've seen with some of these reports where they will inflate the soil volume estimates in order to have a higher cost, in order to freak community members out, where we'll say, look, you just said you, if, if there's a piece of contamination near a pond, you just need to remove that contamination. But your report says you're going to dig up the entire pond you can be a lot more surgical about it. So I'm always very suspect, frankly, of, of the uh, cost estimates that we get. In terms of getting involved, I also didn't share um, my, um, uh, my um, email information, but um, psr-la.org is my organization. Um, and um, I believe my email is still on the website there. It's d-d-u-f-f-i-e-l-d at psr-la.org. It's probably too much to write down um, while I'm talking here. But I think um, if you want to get involved and see the most latest breaking information, what is happening the most recently, there's a fantastic Facebook page and that is by the parents. And that is, they always have the freshest information and ways to get involved. And that's facebook.com slash parents versus SSFL. Or if you just Google parents versus SSFL Facebook, you'll get to it. And, and that is a really happening place. We, by, before any of the other you know, NGOs that are working on something can get something up online, write something about it, um, the community members, Melissa's got it up there. So um, I highly recommend um, that Facebook page for latest breaking information and how to get involved or, or contact me. Okay, thank you, Denise. And I'd like to, us to applause all our speakers for a very informative talk. Please tell other attendees, because this recording will be behind a paywall, uh, to please um, dig into this topic by l 
looking at the recording of this session. Uh, I think uh, many of us have learned a lot of disturbing information about radioactive waste and we, we'd like more people to know about it. So a, a round of applause for all our speakers. Thank you.